Collins, and I am the Captain at Gosford. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bethwin, and I'm the Vice Captain at Gosford High School, and together, Tom and I will be hosting tonight. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and also pay my respects to elders past, present, and future. So tonight's uh, presentation is being filmed by members of our school media team. This footage will be uploaded to our school website for parents and caregivers that were able to attend tonight. So I would like to address our principal, Mrs. Smith, for his principal's address. Thank you, Tom and Bethlehem. Well, welcome parents. You are officially our first parent evening that we've been able to host since 26th of March last year. So, um, certainly been some time between having parents in the school, but it is actually lovely to have parents coming and joining us again for evenings and information nights. Um, as you know, we've had Oliver, which was a great success as well, and it was a real, I think, brilliant way to showcase the beginning of what we can only hope is a very normal year in terms of what we can offer at Gosford High School and our whole curriculum. Obviously tonight is all about assessment and I guess giving parents the power to be able to engage with their, their child about what is on in order this year, uh, what is different in stage six to the previous years, ways that you can support your child because they're certainly going to be testing times over the next two years if some of them haven't already occurred. And I guess the expectations from us as a school and also that from NESA, which is uh, ultimately the board of studies as it used to be known that determines the rules and regulations that we have to follow when we talk about school assessment and the HSC. You are sitting in what is an assessment format for our year 12, current, uh, our current year 12, 180 students at an English assessment class this afternoon. And this is exactly what the hall was set up like for their task. Uh, all students doing the task at the same time as part of the assessment policy, and uh, we have them all in here doing that. We have another task first thing tomorrow morning, and to be nice to our one GA who has to set up the hall and pack it up and put it all back together. We decided with COVID and we have to keep everyone separated. It was highly appropriate to uh, keep the table set up in the manner they are. So it wasn't just to show you what an assessment task looks like, it was actually to do a very nice thing for our GA and be fair to him, and it actually suits the purpose of the evening. But I guess as you walked in, you got that feeling and that sense of, I guess, being reminded what it is actually like to walk into an example and fill out bits of paper and be prepared to do a task. And uh, that is an overwhelming feeling for a lot of students, and we try to get them as used to it as we can with the experience from Year 7 right through, and all of our tasks in Year 7 right through to Year 12 ultimately follow a very similar policy. And the reason we do that is practice, pre preparation. Uh, obviously, we've got very, very academically gifted students, and they put high pressure on themselves in tasks, and we have to make sure it's really fair and clear when we talk about assessment and the rules. There have been a lot of changes. The biggest change that we've noted, noticed in schools with the HSC is the way that the universities are looking at what happens in schools and acknowledging the work that teachers and students are doing in that time. And the way that's been played out is in what we call early entries. And tonight we have uh, Dave Snedden here, who is sitting down there, who will talk to you from a career and transition point of view as to how that looks for students in year 12. But what that does mean is that the HSC, as an exam at the end, and school assessment, ultimately leads to an ATAR, but what we're seeing more and more is all those attributes that students accumulate in their time at school, having meaning and actually being worth a lot comes to applying for university places. And when you're in a school such as Gosford High School, which has a good reputation for students' results, that plays very well. And we see it, in fact, last year, Mr. Stanton will talk about the uh, statistics in terms of number of students getting their first choice offers. And it is extremely high, and a lot of those students knew before they even walked in here to do a HSC exam. 
So for us as a school, that, that is a real change, and I guess in education, not just because of COVID, but across the board, we're seeing that shift in the way assessment is being played out. I could talk a lot about marks and what happens and what the ranks and the averages are at our school. Uh, last year, you, you know, our, our top student got 99.95. You can't complain about that. That's a, ultimately the highest mark given in the major. Uh, and we had um, a mean of about 87. So, you know, over a third of students getting eight cards of over 90. And of those students, a large number already knowing that they were going to the university of their choice. So, lots of information tonight I won't talk too long. If there's time at the end, we'll take a few questions. Um, we are doing it in a very formal setting because this works best on the camera for the people that are viewing later. And obviously that will give you an opportunity to go over anything that you want to go over um, from tonight at a later date. But welcome back. It's good to see parents in Osborne High School. I uh, hope you find tonight useful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'd now like to welcome the Year 11 Year Advisor, Ms. Colleen Mulvaney, to speak with you. Good evening, everyone. I'm here tonight so you can finally put a face to my name after COVID has separated for way too long. My role as Year Advisor at Crossford High is really to be your first point contact with the school. If your child is struggling in any way, such as just feeling overwhelmed with the workload or um, just it may just be a general question about where to go to the next in the school or any of the school policies or anything that may impact on your well-being really, you can contact me. You can do it by emailing through the uh, website. You can uh, call the front office. Either way, the information will get to me and then I can help you come up with best ways that we can both support your, the students' needs. So as you know, we have many people on board to help support students at Crossford High. And um, it makes something simple like helping them write a study timetable or um, put them in touch with welfare support services. But my, my role really is just to help you and point the student in the right direction. So all students know that I live in the science staff group, so if they're ever confused at all or how to get help or any information, they can come down and see me in person. But uh, you also know that I now live in the student group the science staff group, so you can also help direct them there as well. So I'm really looking forward to supporting the child through the next couple of years at CrossFit. It can and often does become very stressful for them. However, we found that working really closely with families and teachers and the school together, it often makes the students feel much, much more safe in that environment. So please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. We'll now hear from our year 11 deputy, principal, uh, deputy principal, Mrs. Scott, who will explain how assessment works in year 11. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you for everybody for attending tonight, and thank you to those at home who eventually watch this footage. As Mr. Smith said, our governing body is NISA, who um, determine the rules and procedures um, that the HSC assessment is based on. So if you get a moment at home, you can look up um, the NISA website, and there I've just done a couple of screenshots of what you may look up and research to help support your student. We've got past papers, what is the HSC, assessment information, etc. So if you get a moment, there's a lot of reading there. Um, if you need to, if you're unsure, there's a little um, leaflet today also that you'll take home with a glossary of key terms that you may hear your children talking about. Um, when they're unpacking their assessment tasks that may be helpful for you. This presentation will also, this PowerPoint will also be uploaded to the parent portal as well so that um, you can have this PowerPoint as well as the recorded footage to support anything that's being unpacked tonight. 
So the main thing is attendance. If your child is missing school, they're missing content, they're missing curriculum, explicit curriculum of delivery and instruction of that in the classroom. So attendance is a very big factor in successful um, student outcomes. So Gosford High School requires students to attend all classes in each subject. And attendance is closely monitored by the classroom teacher and contact will be made home if the student is falling under a significant percentage because that means that they're missing explicit direct instruction, not understanding the course content, which would have an impact on their ability to access and complete assessment tasks. And the students need to be at school two days prior to of any assessment tasks. So if they're absent for any reason and there's no documentation or significant information about that for themselves, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail, then that's deemed that they have had some time at home, they have an advantage over their peers in an assessment task and we're all about equality and equity in accessing and completing assessment tasks. Now, your students won't have this as yet, but there may be an opportunity in year 12 where students have flexible attendance, where their timetable doesn't really start to period two, or it ends at period four. That is flexible attendance. But if that your child has a, a free period or a, a, a timetable study period through the day, where they have no timetable period, then they need to be on site. They need to be in the library, or the senior study, or seeing the teacher about work. Otherwise, if they're not on site, it's a truancy. So flexible attendance is at the start or the end of any school day, predominantly more in year 12, and if they have a period without a timetable subject, a study period they go to the following location. So if they come home, and they say, I had a free period today. No, they didn't. That is, they didn't use their study period productively. Now, assessment, a little bit more unpacked. Your children were spoken to by myself um, in around the middle of February, the 16th, 15th of February, in the hall as a cohort. And the assessment policy was unpacked with, with them. For example, things like you need to be at school two days prior to an assessment task, if you are absent, etc, etc. They had all read through this uh, document digitally, it was uploaded to their Google Classroom. However, the hard copy is coming home this week and there is a portion in that booklet that they get to keep on their desk at home to reference for you to have a look through where they're at with their assessment schedules. And there's a page at the back that's a green page and that needs to be completed by the student and yourselves to say that they've read and fully understood the assessment policy and adhere to all of the guidelines, rules and procedures around assessment at Boston High School. So that will be coming home in the next few days. But basically assessment is looking at the students across the course in a range of assessment task styles. Because we all know that everybody learns differently. So if we're all sitting a test, not all of us work well under test conditions. So there's a variety of assessment tasks across each course that catches the students in different learning styles. So staff are looking at formative assessment. So that is the preparation leading up to the formal assessment. In class, reflection of their own work conversations with teachers about how feedback can be implemented for improvement, etc. Self-assessment, where the peers might do peer marking or mark each other, mark themselves using the marking criteria. And the summative assessment is the final result of a test, more formal assessment. So on the right there is the policy that was uploaded to you on the 15th of February, the parent portal, and emailed as well. And also, 
put on the students who were classroom. And that's what's coming up this week in hard copy format. So please take the time to go through that with yourselves and with your children. Look at the subjects in there that they have chosen for their HSC pattern of study. And this is what one particular subject would look like. This is an example of an assessment schedule. And the English Advanced Assessment Schedule looks like this. Three assessment tasks across the course. So we can see that, task one, task two, and task three. We can also see what type of task it is, the nature of the task. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a range of assessment tasks across each course. We also then see when that assessment task will take place, so the students can plan their submissions. We also can see on that assessment schedule what outcomes are assessed in that task. So what syllabus outcomes from the English Advanced course are being assessed in that particular task. We then go down to the components of the English Advanced course, what components are being assessed and the total assessment percentage down the bottom there. So that would be the year 11, and it is the year 11 English Advanced Assessment Task Schedule that most of your children will be doing this year. Students in year 10, at the end of year 10, complete all my own work module around signing off that the work that they submit is theirs and theirs only. And it is the student's responsibility if they are absent to catch up on any work missed the exact day they return, not the following week. There are far too many students at Gosford High School for teachers to chase individually, so the only son or child to catch up on anything that they miss while they're absent. A non-serious attempt. So, we know when we're marking work if that's a serious, we know actually students that we teach, if it's a non-serious attempt, then the discussion takes place and the assessment process is followed regarding parent contact, interviews with head teachers and faculties, deputy principals, etc. A non-attempt. So, not attempting a paper is a breach of assessment policy because there's not their potential, not working to their potential and it breaches the assessment policy and the protecting each task with the civil value. All submissions, sorry, eight, all eight submissions without the process that I'm about to speak about being followed, receive a zero. And I've used this image from Mrs. Scalise's slides from last year because I couldn't find anything better, it's perfect. says it all. There are so many formats of saving work in this day and age. You could do Google Drive, Mr. Be Safe stuff, USBs, emailing to yourself, backing it up, backing it up, and backing it up. So that is not an excuse for not handing us an assessment task in. Okay, so if your child is ill, there needs to be a doctor's certificate for all cases of illness. Parent letter can be um, shown, particularly if there's an event out of your control that's impacted on your child attending school. And there's a, a wide variety of reasons for that. So, early contact, that moment, bring the school. They can't attend school, there's something happened, there's been a car crash they're involved in, um, they'll, they'll make it to school tomorrow, we'll let you know how they are. But if they're not contacting, then you know, that's not adhering to the assessment policy. Students who are representing the school for any variety of reasons, whether it be sporting, cultural, have to get permission prior to the assessment day 
and the assessment process is adhered to regarding some form of extension suited to that representation. Once again, before the task. And once again, it's about contact, contacting us as soon as possible. If your child is ill, they would come the next day with a medical certificate to see the deputy principal. An illness misadventure form would be provided that they take home, the head teacher and the deputy have a conversation about the best possible time for that task to be put up. Okay? First day back at school and it is your child's obligation. So please have that conversation with them around that part of the process. And this is a form that is the back of the assessment booklet that you have been emailed. It's on the parent portal that students will get. On the left hand side is the process that you undertake the instructions of what you need to do if your child is ill. And on the right hand side is the documentation required, including a medical certificate. This is another appendix in the assessment booklet. This is a medical certificate. If you're organised enough, um, have some of these printed off and you can take that to the doctor when you go with them. You won't need a medical doctor's certificate that can fill that in. Okay? And I suppose the conversation needs to be had with your child about what happened with 7 to 10. What did you learn from your school in year 7, 8, 9 and 10? Did you learn that you aren't as organised as what you think? That you are very organised but you stress a lot? Everyone's different. So have a conversation about what worked well in year 10 for you. How do you think your learning is going to change? How it's going to be different. Talk that through. What things help them do well in the past and how, how can I keep doing these things? How can I sustain it as I get older and maybe get more shifts at work? Have a better, bigger social life. How can I sustain it with that balance? What things didn't work? What didn't help me? And what can I do differently to improve that this year? In um, your handout there is a page and I referred to it earlier. This is the um, glossary of key terms from NESA. Keep that with the documentation from tonight. And you, there are some words in there that are in assessment tasks, assessment tasks language, and that will help you kind of navigate those NESA words in assessment tasks. Okay. So what I'm going to do is actually do this. We're going to turn to the advanced English assessment task you have on your desk. And we're going to do what a student would do and what you can talk your child through at home when they get an assessment task so they can plan for success. So break it down. You would be looking at the task description. This particular task has two parts. So maybe you would be saying to your children, let's aim for part A, having a, a bit of a draft by the end of the week or the end of two weeks. Part B, when's it due in a month's time? Let's aim for that. So you're looking at timelines and helping your children plan for success. You're also looking at the outcomes of the task for the syllabus. What is being asked of your children in this task? That will tell you that. And then if your child wants to achieve higher marks in this task, they'll be looking at the top descriptors in the marking criteria. What does 17 to 20 look like? Highly developed, sophisticated writing. Encourage your children to hand in some drafts. Go and see the teachers earlier rather than later so that they can get the feedback to implement to refine their responses or their submissions for assessment tasks. And revise. Think of each assessment task as a stepping stone to the long game, the end game.
and your students should be um, talking to teachers about, or the teachers talking to your students about revising study tips look different in each subject as well. What can they do in English? Might look different to what revision looks like in maths, for example. But if they have a bad assessment task, it didn't go according to plan, but it's not the end of the world. It's part of the course. Move on, learn from that, and build a better assessment submission for next time. You've also been given a term assessment plan there that you can take home and use if need be with your children for term two, term one. There's some spares up the front if you'd like additional copies. Write their assessment tasks on when they're due, when they come in, so that you can use that as a bit of a guide there. Because the students like to use their phones, okay? There's something more visual in front of them when they're studying might help them a little bit more. A study timetable, that's week by week. You've got a copy of that as well. In there could go a couple of worksheets. In there could go, got an English assessment happening, so there might be a couple of hour slots of English. Like this, the example I've got on the desk as well. So week by week, the study timetable would vary depending on what the assessment task is at that time. However, not neglecting other courses. And some breaks for dinner there too. Make sure they do. Okay, so be prepared of all the things that I've said and what you'll hear tonight. Have the conversations early. Try to help your children be prepared for assessments and schooling. Take breaks. It's not healthy staying for five hours. It doesn't work. So encourage them to just step out of their room. Go for a walk around the block. Drink water, not energy drinks. Okay? It's the simple things, but they do mean a lot. Better snacks, brain food snacks, sleep. Try to um, monitor screen time in bed, etc. Rest that brain, ready for the next day. Breathe. Just take a moment to de stress and just have a moment to breathe. Just slow everything down. Positive thoughts. If you're hearing some negative stuff, turn it around. Try and help them. Good evening everyone, um, I think I've got a slightly rough end of the deal because I did have some slides. Um, anyway, it's still hard to remember. Um, so, um, I'd like to introduce myself, I'm the Head of Teacher Welfare and really um, my, what I want to talk to you tonight just um, carries on from what uh, Bill and Maloney, the Year 11 Year Advisor, said as well. Um, really, we just want to provide support to your young person um, over the next couple of years. We know it's going to be uh, at times, very busy for them, at times quite stressful and we just want to build in support around them. Uh, and that's really what we do um, as part of our welfare team, of course the year advisors uh, play a really critical role. Um, as Ms Maloney said, she is your first point of contact. If you've got any concerns, um, if you would just like to reach out um, and convey them to her and then obviously with Ms Maloney you will get in touch with me for something which I can help with as well. Um, and that's really important. We also have uh, an assistant year advisor, and that's Mr. Uh, John Cockman, who's uh, down there as well. I'm going to try to put his hand up too. Um, and all we are trying to do, as I said, is build support around the young person uh, if and when they need them. Um, and so, yes, uh, I'm in charge of the, the wellbeing um, team, uh, and really that's divided up into two things. We have um, a welfare side, uh, and then we have a learning and support side as well. And the welfare side, as mentioned, uh, starts from the top down, starts with our principal and our deputy principal for year 11, and that's Ms. Clampett, uh, and then there's me as the head teacher welfare, and then there's the year advisor team. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a school counsellor um, every day at the school. We have two different school counsellors, but it means we do actually have a school counsellor here um, present every day. 
and the students can self-refer to a school counsellor and um, we can also refer them as well and we can work with you if you think that your young person might benefit from that service as well. So um, there's different ways where we can um, obviously sort of put them in contact with people who can support and help them. Um, we like to think um, as part of the welfare, welfare team that we're very approachable and we've got uh, ability to build good relationships with young people as well. And so generally, either myself, Ms. Malone, Mr. Cobham will be that first point of contact and then we discuss uh, options, as I said, if and when uh, they need them over the two years. And um, there's also external supports out there too. Um, we work very closely with other agencies um, and other um, great supports out there. Uh, for example, Headspace um, and also uh, the website and um, uh, WeChat is absolutely fantastic as a, uh, as a source of advice for parents, for young people, uh, and also for us as well, we often refer to WeChat too. So um, those are services um, which we would always refer young people to as well. Um, from the learning support, here they are, so from the learning support team uh, side as well, um, again from the top down, um, principal, deputy principal, head teacher welfare, learning support teacher, and that you can the last, and then student learning support officer as they say. Um, with regards to learning support, we might just um, flip to the next slide if that's okay. Um, we're actually we're going to learning support now. Um, learning support uh, really does encompass um, support, support for students uh, with disability or with additional um, learning and support needs. Um, and probably by this stage, um, if your young person fits into those categories, um, will you probably introduce yourself to the learning support team? We've probably been in contact as well. Um, with any students with disability who, or who require additional, um, uh, who have additional learning needs or support, um, generally we would have um, uh, formed an IEP individual ed education plan which you would have been communicating to about, and we would have had open lines of communication with the way through. But really, an IEP is, is a, a plan which is uh, designed to um, support your young person in a, in a classroom environment um, so teachers are able to um, help and support their particular personalised learning needs as well. Um, we do have a very uh, small but very dedicated team within learning support and our learning support teacher is a first point of contact if there's a particular learning need or, or particular additional need or disability that your young person has uh, that we need to uh, obviously um, help um, with in the school environment. So please reach out, as I said, if you haven't done already, if you know there's anything that we need to know to support your young person, that's been helpful too. Um, in terms of uh, those specifics, we, we um, support individual students, but um, you can see through some of the advice which has been given to you tonight, one of the best ways to support your young person um, is through uh, those general but very important study skills uh, which have been mentioned before. Uh, Ms. Clinton went through a whole list of strategies which are actually um, you know, amazing strategies. They, they sound like common sense, but a lot of young people overlook them or neglect them. Time management, organisation, prioritising, uh, and then those very simple steps about taking breaks and completing a study timetable. Those are very, very powerful strategies which will help over the next two years. Um, we actually um, work alongside a, a study schools company called Elevate, which is the main study schools provider in New South Wales and actually in Australia as well. Uh, and they've been coming in and would have um, given seminars and workshops to your young person over the last few years. Um, and that continues in year 11. Uh, and the skills they provide is a general study skills and they go in tandem with the ones that we mentioned here as well. They also offer parent webinars um, and there's, another, there's a one coming up tomorrow uh, where they've already done the ones on time management posts. We'll advertise on our Facebook page. Uh, but they're a service which they provide because they're a partner, we're in partnership with them as well. The one tomorrow might be of interest. Um, it's not necessarily aimed at senior students, it's aimed at all students, but it's about um, technology usage and how to help a young person manage their technology, um, which is probably uh, a very important um, sort of seminar for, I guess, the person who apparently never existed, uh, really, but uh, it is a very useful one. So um, there's a link on our website, and if you click on that, you can just go through and register. Um, the final thing just on this slide is regards to disability provisions. Um, disability provisions uh, is something which NESA approve and if there is a student with a disability or an additional learning need who is eligible, uh, they may be able to access disability provisions which is our adjustments which help them 
uh, particularly uh, in exam conditions, uh, and, and uh, that's something which is very, very important to, to some of the students that they have a disability or additional need, uh, which would impact them if they did um, an exam in the, the, the traditional circumstances, such as in a big hall like this. So, oftentimes, a disability provision for uh, a particular student might be to have um, separate supervision because they might have a sensory need. Um, or they might have uh, a diagnosis of anxiety and that might help them with that. Uh, there is a fairly rigorous process for that and it needs to be supported by um, extensive documentation through GPs and through, um, as I said, diagnosis from uh, child psychologists, for example. But it's something that if um, it's, as I said, sort of important to a child, if it's something which they need, it's something they should have. So make sure you follow that process as well and explore that um, if it's something which is relevant to you. Um, going, the final thing for me is just in regards to other student welfare sort of programs that we run over the senior years. You may have, um, a young person may have told you that we had a life ready week a couple of weeks ago. Um, and again, that's to uh, help students to navigate the, the next couple of years and to build up um, some of those um, social and emotional uh, skills which they are going to stand them in good stead and maybe to workshops and things like uh, adaptability, resilience, inclusion and diversity, communication, um, and that's all about, as I said, helping them to form uh, who they are and making uh, as much as we can, helping them on their journey to be um, in a position to be a well-rounded individual who has the skills to, to negotiate and navigate uh, the next two years as well. Um, we've also uh, had people come in to uh, give advice and guidance on social media. We did that last year, we'll continue to do that. As I mentioned before, we have counselling available uh, every day at school, and as I said, um, we work very much um, with the intention of being a point of contact and triage to put the young person uh, in touch with the supports they need. So if we don't have the direct answers, we can find people who do, because as I said, we just want to make sure that your um, young people are supported over the next two years and throughout that whole academic career that we And that's it for me. Thank you very much. to speak uh, with you as part of our career and transition team. Uh, hi, my name's David Smith. I know some of you, I'm fortunate that I teach some of your kids and I thank you for that. I um, had a great year in the last issue, so that's a great thing. Um, I'm part of a bigger team, careers and transition team. I work, I'm a transition advisor, I work with the careers advisor, Ms. Brady, and our job is to work out how to help you guys and students navigate year 13, so what happens after they leave here. Um, Mr. Smith alluded to it before, how did we do last year? We did really well last year. We had 72 offers pre-trial. What that means is about half of the cohort of 2020 had a place at the university before they sat at HSC trials. I think that's a really good thing. Um, Overall, 160 out of 172 students received what appeared to be first preference offers by the time we got through to the end of December and the first rounds in January. So university offers are spread from first offers are in August and then they run all the way through the end of January. And in fact, I think the final round this year is in February because of COVID impact. Those early entry offers, and I'm going to say this a few times tonight so the message gets through, are based on the year 11 results. Yeah. So, one of the things I heard when I started teaching here was, I don't worry about year 11, it doesn't count. Because the marks get reset. But with everything that happened last year and the changes, that has had a huge impact on it. So, your young person, your students report from year 11 and their marks from year 11 can get them into the university. And that's a really good thing from where I sit. It doesn't mean they're going to get into their course they absolutely want to do, so they may still have to step up and do all the work. Uh, but the landscape is really changing. So once upon a time, the ATAR, which we'll talk to you about later on, was the key component.
I'm not, that's not anymore. There's a few other things I'm going to talk about. So, how do we work with your kids, the young people? How do we help them out? Uh, we have an office in the senior study. They can drop in and have a chat to us at any time. We encourage them to make an appointment um, because that's the expectation in the adult world. But at the same time, then, I, tomorrow morning we'll be in there at 7.30 and I will have 10 or 11 kids drop in between 7.30 and 9 to have a chat. And that's what we do. We try to provide some of them. Some of them will come and have a talk about what they're going to do. We run drop-in sessions or um, targeted sessions. So we've, in the past, run sessions for kids who want to do law, kids who want to do medicine, kids who want to do uh, engineering. We will be running a year 11 medicine session in the next few weeks because kids who are thinking about doing medicine need to start planning fairly shortly. Um, but they also need to make sure that that is realistic. It's a tough course. Have a plan B, that's all I can say. We have a couple of partner unis that we work with, the Macquarie Uni and Newcastle Uni, and they we have a, a slightly easier pathway, I guess, for those two universities. They get adjustment points. So, again, next year we'll talk about adjustment points, but kids get plus five if they select Macquarie and Newcastle. So, of course, there's an 85, they get an 80. 80 plus five equals 85, they're off to Newcastle. Again, that we'll do with next year. All of this is, is run through UAP, University Admissions Centre. Uh, about two weeks ago we ran a session, or UAC ran a session for Year 12 parents explaining exactly how it works, and in about 50 weeks' time we will run the same session for you guys. It was really successful, uh, it was a Zoom session, we had 154 participants, which was really good. And it will let you understand how UAC work and how the ranking works. It's a bit early to have that discussion because there's an awful lot that happens. We're really lucky because this school has a thing called the Chapman Fund. The Chapman Fund, um, uh, a virtual website called the Careers Department, which we subscribe to. And we worked with your kids last year in year 10. They may or may not have told you that. They had a careers lesson every two weeks. They were signed up for the Careers Department. And the Careers Department uh, provides a profile. It's like a Maya Briggs, but it's not a profile. Of course, they're one of six categories. There is a parent option that you have to pay for, but I would suggest you go home and say, oh, Mr. Smith was talking about the careers department. Can you show it to me? And everything that you need will pop up. And it will give you some indication as to what your kids' skill sets or how your kids do their skill sets. And personally, my kids did it a few years ago. I found it quite amazing because what I thought and what they thought comes up long enough to tell you how far um, work experience. COVID really hit us for six. Totally. Year 10, which was last year for you guys, work experience is not what we do. We couldn't do any. We've got, um, there's some really big programs that are always oversubscribed. So on the Zoom run program, the Reptile Hunt run program. We can't get anyone into them this year because they're still dealing with last year. So we're playing catch up across the board. The really good thing about the careers department is it lets young people do virtual work experience. If a kid comes to me and says, I want to be a pilot, can I do work experience? This is not going to happen. But there's a 15 minute video that explains a day in the life of a pilot that interviews the pilot, talks about how he got there, what his qualifications were, what he needed to do, what his skill set was. And it's way broader than anything we can offer. Every week they add new professions, new careers, new subsets to it. So it's a really valuable resource for the students who you guys can see it to stick into what we do it for you. Um, all right, to finish up, and then I keep here all night. Nothing to do this year from my point of view. We have no signing up, no sending money off, no worrying about any of those things. Next year we deal with it. But what have we got to do? And I'm going to say this again. Year 11 is so important. AMU, uh, in my humble opinion, one of Australia's premier universities for many areas of study, 
gave out last year before the trials, guaranteed places for double degree in your arts. All the students had to do was complete their HSC, get an A star, any number, and they were going to AMU. Now not everyone can be supported to go to AMU. We live on the Central Coast, we can't commute to Canberra. Some people can support their kids to go to AMU. And if that's an option, it's an unreal option. It's not the only option. We do work, as I said, we have two partner unions, but we also work with New Sydney, when it's WBTS, University of Western Sydney, all of them. I did early entry applications this year at the University of New England this morning. So, we need to be on it. ANU's entry system is based on the Year 11 report, a personal statement, and a referee. Newcastle and Macquarie are heading down the same path. Finally, a couple of things. Term three last year would have been when we said to them, go to uni, go and experience an open day. Of course, there were no open days last year. We are really hoping that term three, we're going to have open days. They're on Saturdays and Sundays. I encourage you to encourage your students to attend open days at universities that are sustainable for them or that they wish to go to. And I'll finish you with this analogy. Universities are three, four, five year deal. It's going to cost 50, 60, 100, 200 thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Yeah? How, many, how many of you guys have bought a car based on what the website said or what the brochure said? My strong suspicion is none of you. So the brochure, other people's opinions, they're all fine, but I want the keys. I'm going to take it for a drive. How do we do that at uni? We go to an open day. We meet the people. We've already met our partner unions. Your kids have met the partner unions with Warrington and Newcastle a couple of weeks ago. But if we're looking at New Sydney and NSW and UTS, let's go down, let's experience, let's let them tell us what it's like. And their student ambassadors, who are kids who have just left school in the last couple of years, they will tell it as it is. So I look at the University Open Day as a test drive. Yeah. Do we like it? Can we get there? Is it going to be sustainable? So, a few other bits and pieces up there. The things called school recommendation schemes, leaders and achievers options, and elite sports board. These are schemes that help these kids get to uni. But as I said before, year 11 has is is become more important. The ATAR is still part of it, but the other thing I've got written in big letters in front of me is a holistic approach to life. These schemes, Achievers, they want your kids to have a life outside of school. They want them to do some volunteer work or coach a netball team or coach a football team or contribute. And that adds weight to an application for year 11. So just think about all of that. And if we get all those ducks in a row, then we can make sure that we have exactly the same sort of results in 2022. Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Tom and I would now like to share our experiences with you here tonight um, about how we've navigated stage six for the students as well. Before year 11 started, I was extremely nervous about the transition to my senior years. I'd never been a super high performing student and I felt a lot of pressure to all of a sudden be the best of all my subjects, as well as manage a full-time training work for my school, keep my job, maintain a social life and have enough downtime to not get burnt out. I was in this weird place of wanting to enjoy school, knowing my dates were limited, whilst also feeling ridiculously overwhelmed by the assessment I was learning around the corner. As you can imagine, this caused me a lot of stress, but after speaking more recently to my friends, I found this was a pretty common theme for my new group, so it's likely that your child is feeling the same way. I was, however, fortunate enough to have a really solid support system from both my teachers at school and my parents at home, which eased the pressure and made navigating year 11 much more manageable. First of all, my parents took some time to try and understand the system, what the ATAR is, how it works, and how much Year 11 actually matters towards it, and spoiler, it doesn't matter. They knew that my Year 11 results did matter for the early entry to uni and to get a base understanding for Year 12, but were able to remind me that it was okay to take a break whenever I was super overwhelmed or disappointed in my Being reassured that my 19 out of 20 was not going to wreck my ATAR and completely ruin my life was 
Next, I have an awareness of when my assessment tasks were on and helped me by breaking them down into smaller bits, memorizing content such as reading my flashcards with me, um, helping me get my bag ready the night before with any supplies I might need the next day, and also alleviating any stresses or pressures at home, like cooking my dinner, not reminding me to clean my room or stuff the dishwasher until after my task was due, and understanding that I wasn't being rude when I was in my room studying or leaving to the table. This allowed me to focus on one thing at a time and reduced a lot of my anxieties. Now, embarrassing as this to admit, there were plenty of times when I would have a complete meltdown over an assignment or some homework, and thankfully my family were very understanding of this. I found that simply knowing I could talk to them about how I was feeling and having them listen without judgment made it a lot easier to work with. They reminded me that how I was feeling was okay and normal and to just do whatever I needed in that exact moment, like having some water, taking a shower, and then breaking the assessment into small bits. My parents knew the pressure I was under, what I was placing on myself, and what I felt from peers and teachers, and so did their best not to put risks at home. They weren't constantly on my back about needing to study or needing to get good marks, and if anything, they reminded me more often that taking downtime is equally as important. Being understanding that we know what's expected of us, we will procrastinate from time to time, and we're going to have to make mistakes in order to learn from them is much more helpful than knowing what else about our age constantly. Finally, my mum and dad have been incredibly supportive of, of my 100 million career changes, from wanting to be a doctor, to a PA teacher, to not, to not wanting to be uni at all, back to a doctor, to a physio, and everything in between. I know that what I pray to, I will have the support of my parents the whole time. They know that my brother, who is studying to be an astrophysicist, and I will follow different paths, and so they don't compare us. As a result, I don't have the added pressure of always needing to impress them, because I know they are always proud of me and always be there regardless of the path I choose to follow. This has made me feel like I'm in control of my future and has motivated me to work, to work harder for myself because I want the grades, not because I feel like I need to live up to the expectations of someone else. My food tech teacher always says that there are three keys to success in the HSC. The student putting in the effort, the support of the teachers, and having a positive home environment. I found this to be extremely true so far in my senior journey, and whilst, of course, my parents aren't always perfect, and you won't be either, Feeling supported at home goes a long way. As a fellow 16 year old, I can promise that even though we don't always show it, we are extremely grateful for the assistance our parents give us, especially through challenges like the HSC. Making sure you have open conversations with your child and are understanding of them throughout your 11 and 12 will help more than you know and will be essential to helping them achieve the success that they can. Now, time looks like. Tom the school captain as I introduced myself earlier. So I'm going to be talking about the transition to senior school. So the transition to senior school is I would say the biggest jump in my school in life so far and it will be the biggest jump in all of your students' um, lives as well. So uh, you suddenly go from test results that mean absolutely nothing in year 10 to year 11 test results which can help in getting early entries and scholarships and of course year 12 test results which count for half of your HSC mark. Uh, last year I was fortunate enough to experience the transition to senior school a bit quicker, um, so I did the accelerated English course um, in year 10, so I was doing year 11 English in year 10, so that means I got to do senior school a bit early, which was quite helpful, but uh, for a lot of parents in this room, your um, sons and daughters may not have had that experience. So one of the major parts of the transition that I found when you're moving towards senior school is study periods. So you'll find that there are non-timetable classes in your um, timetable. So when you get to senior school, uh, your days do not look like five periods anymore. Um, once a fortnight, now I have one uh, five period day and all my other days are less than five periods. However, study periods are also like a time machine. You look up and it's back to class or it's the end of the day. So you need to make sure that you're studying in these periods. That is, I would say, the biggest, uh, biggest part of the transition to senior school if you're telling your kids make sure that they're studying during these periods because they can alleviate a lot of stress in studying at home and you get more free time at home to do other things outside of school. Uh, this is important, especially during extra uh, sorry, uh, during our upcoming exam times. So when you have upcoming exams, this extra hour of study or two hours of study you might get in during the, uh, during the week leading up to the exam is quite crucial. Uh, Content-wise, another part of the transition to senior school is that it gets significantly more challenging. This was one of the first things I noticed uh, as I transitioned towards senior English in year 10. So instead of skimming the surface like a junior school, subjects will go much further in depth. 
This means that not only is the content harder to understand in parts, but it's also a great deal more content. So this can be easily overcome during the transition by just a little bit more discipline. So this might just mean studying a bit more on the weekend or studying a lot more during exam times if you want to do well in the upcoming exam. Uh, it also means that you have to be revising content a bit more often. I know in junior school that you can get around not writing notes or um, maybe skipping out on your side time work, but in senior school, the part, important part of the transition is that you have to be ensuring that you are doing all of your revision and keeping up with all your subjects, otherwise it can be quite overwhelming. So during the transition to senior school, I would say the content itself is probably the part that kids get most overwhelmed with. Um, another particularly important part of the transition to senior school is when it comes to extracurricular activities. So in your senior school you find that you have a lot less time, however, cutting that, those extracurricular activities off is not a good idea. In fact, um, they can be managed really easily, it just means that at some points you have to make priorities. So for example, um, I sort of work at work Coles for an extracurricular. Um, this meant that I was going to actually put my job at Coles, um, but my boss tore up the resignation letter and he said that as long as I worked on the school holidays, I could just work basically whenever he needed someone to work desperately. So sometimes it just means that you have to get creative with your extracurricular activities and you also have to make priorities. So if he desperately needs someone and it's around exam time, I know that I can't accept that if I need to do well in this upcoming exam. So from my own experience, the most difficult part of the transition towards senior school was simply time management. So this can be extremely difficult when you have a geography report due on Friday, a HSC English task due Monday morning, and a math test on Tuesday. At that point in year 11 when I had all these, I was very bad at time management. Geography and English got fantastic marks, but needless to say, math did not as it got neglected. This is a bad example of time management. You have to be devoting an equal amount of your time to each subject during your transition. This is quite important because these will all equally count towards your HSC. So if you want to do well, you want to do well in all your subjects and not have one dragging you down. Another difficulty I had during the transition to senior school is just doubting myself as I'm kind of a perfectionist. Um, I know a lot of students feel the same in that when the assessment tasks get a bit harder, um, you can start to doubt yourself and you don't know if you're going to do as well as you hoped. So many light nights last year when I was doing the HSC for English a year early, I laid in wake, uh, wake in bed, not counting sheep, but worrying about the learning task of the HSC, even when this was months away. Um, this was a really bad idea, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I did receive the 12 out of 20 for my creative writing because not a good creative writing, but I still managed to get a 93 mark because Nessa thought it would be cool to throw a curveball at us. So, you know, it's not, you shouldn't be worrying or doubting yourself in senior school because if you put the work in throughout the year consistently, you're going to get a good mark. So, just to sum this all up, the transition towards senior school, my major points are using your study periods wisely, this is crucial. Uh, content is more challenging, however, it just needs more revision constantly. Um, extracurriculars are really important, so don't cut your job, your sport, anything like that out of your life. Uh, you can get a lot of doubt during the transition because you just feel overwhelmed, but there's no need to doubt yourself if you're going to put in the hard yards. And you need to devote equal and ample time on each subject. So, um, with that, I'd like to thank the members of the media team for filming tonight's presentation. I'd also like to thank the members of the Elite Leadership Force for attending to assist um, with me and you upon your arrival. And thank you to all the parents and caregivers for attending Year 11 Parent Information Evening tonight. Thank you for your interest and please uh, travel safely. Good night.